The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 7 Love. Every man on this planet is taking his initiation in love. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. Ospensky states in Tertium Organum that love is a cosmic phenomenon and opens to man the fourth dimensional world, the world of the wondrous. Real love is selfish and free from fear. It pours itself out upon the object of its affection without demanding any return. Its joy is in the joy of giving. Love is God in manifestation and the strongest magnetic force in the universe. Pure, unselfish love draws to itself its own. It does not need to seek or demand. Scarcely anyone has the faintest conception of real love. Man is selfish, tyrannical, or fearful in his affections, thereby losing the things he loves. Jealousy is the worst enemy of love, for the imagination runs riot, seeing the loved one attracted to another, and invariably these fears objectify if they are not neutralized. For example, a woman came to me in deep distress. The man she loved had left her for another woman and said he never intended to marry her. She was torn with jealousy and resentment and said she hoped he would suffer as he had made her suffer, and added, How could he leave me when I loved him so much? I replied, You are not loving that man, you are hating him, and added, You can never receive what you have never given. Give a perfect love, and you will receive a perfect love. Perfect yourself on this man. Give him a perfect, unselfish love, demanding nothing in return. Do not criticize or condemn, and bless him wherever he is. She replied, No, I won't bless him unless I know where he is. Well, I said, That is not real love. When you send out real love, real love will return to you, either from this man or his equivalent, for if this man is not the divine selection, you will not want him. As you are one with God, you are one with the love which belongs to you by divine right. Several months passed, and matters remained about the same, but she was working conscientiously within herself. I said, when you are no longer disturbed by his cruelty, he will cease to be cruel, as you are attracting it through your own emotions. Then I told her of a brotherhood in India who never said good morning to each other. They used these words, I salute the divinity in you. They saluted the divinity in every man and in the wild animals in the jungle, and they were never harmed, for they saw only God in every living thing. I said, Salute the divinity in this man and say, I see your divine self only. I see you as God sees you, perfect, made in his image and likeness. She found she was becoming more poised and gradually losing her resentment. He was a captain, and she always called him the cap. One day she said suddenly, God bless the cap, wherever he is. I replied, now that is real love. And when you have become a complete circle and are no longer disturbed by the situation, you will have his love or attract its equivalent. I was moving at this time and did not have a telephone, so was out of touch with her for a few weeks, when one morning I received a letter saying, we are married. At the earliest opportunity, I paid her a call. My first words were, What happened? Oh, she exclaimed, A miracle! One day I woke up, and all suffering had ceased. I saw him that evening, and he asked me to marry him. We were married in about a week, and I have never seen a more devoted man. There is an old saying, No man is your enemy, no man is your friend. Every man is your teacher. 
So one should become impersonal and learn what each man has to teach him, and soon he would learn his lessons and be free. The woman's lover was teaching her selfish love, which every man sooner or later must learn. Suffering is not necessary for man's development. It is the result of violation of spiritual law, but few people seem able to rouse themselves from their soul sleep without it. When people are happy, they usually become selfish, and automatically the law of karma is set in action. Man often suffers loss through lack of appreciation. I knew a woman who had a very nice husband, but she said often, I don't care anything about being married, but that is nothing against my husband. I'm simply not interested in married life. She had other interests and scarcely remembered she had a husband. She only thought of him when she saw him. One day her husband told her he was in love with another woman and left. She came to me in distress and resentment. I replied, It is exactly what you spoke the word for. You said you didn't care anything about being married, so the subconscious worked to get you unmarried. She said, Oh yes, I see. People get what they want and then feel very much hurt. She soon became in perfect harmony with the situation and knew they were both much happier apart. When a woman becomes indifferent or critical and ceases to be an inspiration to her husband, he misses the stimulus of their early relationship and is restless and unhappy. A man came to me dejected, miserable, and poor. His wife was interested in the science of numbers and had had him read. It seems the report was not very favorable, for he said, My wife says I'll never amount to anything because I am a two. I replied, I don't care what your number is. You are a perfect idea in divine mind, and we will demand the success and prosperity which are already planned for you by that infinite intelligence. Within a few weeks, he had a very fine position, and a year or two later, he achieved a brilliant success as a writer. No man is a success in business unless he loves his work. The picture the artist paints for love of his art is his greatest work. The pot boiler is always something to live down. No man can attract money if he despises it. Many people are kept in poverty by saying, Money means nothing to me. I have a contempt for people who have it. This is the reason so many artists are poor. Their contempt for money separates them from it. I remember hearing one artist say of another, He's no good as an artist, but he has money in the bank. This attitude of mind, of course, separates man from his supply. He must be in harmony with a thing in order to attract it. Money is God in manifestation, as freedom from want and limitation. But it must be always kept in circulation and put to right uses. Hoarding and saving react with grim vengeance. This does not mean that man should not have houses and lots, stocks and bonds, for the barns of the righteous man shall be full. It means that man should not hoard even the principle if an occasion arises when money is necessary. In letting it go out fearlessly and cheerfully, he opens the way for more to come in, for God is man's unfailing and unexhaustible supply. This is the spiritual attitude towards money, and the great bank of the universal never fails. We see an example of hoarding in the film production of Greed. The woman won $5,000 in a lottery, but would not spend it. She hoarded and saved, let her husband suffer and starve, and eventually she scrubbed floors for a living. She loved the money itself and put it above everything, and one night she was murdered and the money taken from her. This is an example of where love of money is the root of all evil. Money in itself is good and beneficial, but used for destructive purposes, hoarded and saved, or considered more important than love, brings disease and disaster and the loss of the money itself. Follow the path of love, 
and all things are added. For God is love, and God is supply. Follow the path of selfishness and greed, and the supply vanishes, or man is separated from it. For example, I knew the case of a very rich woman who hoarded her income. She rarely gave anything away, but bought and bought and bought things for herself. She was very fond of necklaces, and a friend once asked her how many she possessed. She replied, 67. She bought them and put them away, carefully wrapped in tissue paper. Had she used the necklaces, it would have been quite legitimate but she was violating the law of use. Her closets were filled with clothes she never wore and jewels which never saw the light. The old woman's arms were gradually becoming paralyzed from holding on to things, and eventually she was considered incapable of looking after her affairs, and her wealth was handed over to others to manage. So man, in ignorance of the law, brings about his own destruction. All disease, all unhappiness, come from the violation of the law of love. Man's boomerangs of hate, resentment, and criticism come back laden with sickness and sorrow. Love seems almost a lost art, but the man with the knowledge of spiritual law knows it must be regained, for without it he has become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. For example, I had a student who came to me month after month to clean her consciousness of resentment. After a while, she arrived at the point where she resented only one woman, but that one woman kept her busy. Little by little, she became poised and harmonious, and one day, all resentment was wiped out. She came in radiant and exclaimed, you can't understand how I feel. The woman said something to me, and instead of being furious, I was loving and kind. And she apologized and was perfectly lovely to me. No one can understand the marvelous lightness I feel within. Love and goodwill are invaluable in business. For example, a woman came to me complaining of her employer. She said she was cold and critical, and she knew she did not want her in the position. Well, I replied, salute the divinity in the woman and send her love. She said, I can't. She's a marble woman. I answered, you remember the story of the sculptor who asked for a certain piece of marble? He was asked why he wanted it, and he replied, because there is an angel in the marble and out of it he produced a wonderful work of art. She said, Very well, I'll try it. A week later she came back and said, I did what you told me, and now the woman is very kind, and took me out in her car. People are sometimes filled with remorse for having done someone an unkindness, perhaps years ago. If the wrong cannot be righted, its effect can be neutralized by doing someone a kindness in the present. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Sorrow, regret, and remorse tear down the cells of the body and poison the atmosphere of the individual. A woman said to me in deep sorrow, Treat me to be happy and joyous, for my sorrow makes me so irritable with the members of my family that I keep making more karma. I was asked to treat a woman who was mourning for her daughter. I denied all belief in loss and separation and affirmed that God was the woman's joy, love, and peace. The woman gained her poise at once, but sent word by her son not to treat any longer because she was so happy it wasn't respectable. So mortal mind loves to hang on to its griefs and regrets. I knew a woman who went about bragging of her troubles, so of course she always had something to brag about. The old idea was if a woman did not worry about her children, she was not a good mother. 
Now we know that mother fear is responsible for many of the diseases and accidents which come into the lives of children. For fear pictures vividly the disease or situation feared, and these pictures objectify if not neutralized. Happy is the mother who can say sincerely that she puts her child in God's hands and therefore knows that he is divinely protected. For example, a woman awoke suddenly in the night, feeling her brother was in great danger. Instead of giving in to her fears, she commenced making statements of truth, saying, Man is a perfect idea in divine mind and is always in his right place. Therefore, my brother is in his right place and is divinely protected. The next day, she found that her brother had been in close proximity to an explosion in a mine, but had miraculously escaped. So man is his brother's keeper, in thought, and every man should know that the thing he loves dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides under the shadow of the Almighty. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Perfect love casteth out fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, and love is the fulfilling of the law. End of chapter 7